This is part one of two of our discussion with American Johnson. Part two will be uploaded next week. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special episode of Shit Island, where we're joined by none other than Mr. Non-Compete himself, American Johnson. Welcome, and thank you so much for being on the show. Thank wow, you. I feel, I feel so welcome. I, I've always wanted to come to the island of shit, and uh, being here, it's just, as, <laughs> it's just as shitty as I always hoped it would be. So, thank Does you it for smell as much as you expected? Through the internet, the smell is not as intense as I was hoping, but um, mm. I think we can all close our eyes take a deep breath and use our imagination and smell the shit <laughs> virtually of the see, this is good this is good for the internet to know if like we're going to book f- other future guests it's good to know that the smell isn't as overpowering yeah. as one would, might you know expect or fear yeah it, well you know i was so i was great. hoping to get the whole shit experience so i maybe i should have like brought some shit with me i guess in a bowl mm. or something and just set it aside but i didn't i didn't think that far ahead i'm not a planner I've always thought that, you know, the, the shit in Shit Island is uh, the friends we make along the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very poetic thought. Who said that? Hemingway? Yeah, yeah. He first said it. <laughs> so we've all said it. Yeah, yeah. You know, since. This is a smart podcast. <laughs> yes, we are here to be intellectual and uh, engage with <laughs> ideas. So, uh, American, uh, would you like to introduce yourself to uh, to our, our listeners? What is it that you do? Would you have a YouTube channel? What do you do on there? I have a YouTube channel. I do. It's called Non Compete, and uh, we. I'm a I'm an anarcho communist intersectionalist, ne'er do well. Uh, I have a partner, Luna, who has her own channel as well called Luna Oi. But we work together on Non Compete. We do a lot of stuff. We we also we do live streams also on Twitch. Um, we do puppet shows. Uh, we do a lot of like. Uh, you know, theory and uh, history kind of videos, a little bit of everything. Um, sometimes we do things that might resemble comedy if your uh, tastes are, <laughs> if your tastes are yeah, no, not too I, discriminating. I think we can relate, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what we do, right? Stuff that might resemble comedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Accidentally might resemble comedy. If you subscribe to Non Compete, don't, don't get your expectations too high. But um, yeah, but it's, you know, we have a lot of fun. We, and the, I think the best thing we do is we talk to a lot of leftists around the world with interviews and, uh, Mm. and that kind of thing yeah. so that's that's always fun and, and it's it's a big reason i'm excited to be here right now to talk to leftists from other places on the planet so yes yeah, yeah. i'm i'm from the kingdom of sweden and peter's from the kingdom of denmark <laughs> yeah a lot of kingdoms i am living um, in the socialist uh republic of vietnam uh, but i am not from vietnam believe it or not i'm from the united states of america the Kingdom of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. <laughs> the, ah, yes. the Kingdom of the United States of America. <laughs> Who's king and queen? The Kardashians, right? Yes. Yeah, the, I think so. The royal yeah. family. I mean, the, the, yeah, we Trump. got that Trump family. They're, uh, they're something. They're, they're something else. There. They're the ambitious ones. George Bush is in there and the, somewhere. Yeah, and Ellen. Yeah. You know, don't forget Ellen. His best friend. <laughs> George Bush's best Ellen friend. Ellen and... Uh, Ellen and Oprah, Beyonce, those types of people, yeah. It's a very big royal family, very diverse. Family. Oh, yeah. We have, yeah, it's a lot of dukes we, and counts. We pride and... the diversity of our royal family in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> no, very, American, very progressive. Uh, one thing, you're very progressive, American. One thing that I've, I've watched your channel for a long time, and one of the things that I find fascinating is that you say you used to be a capitalist. Oh, yeah. Or you used to run your own business, correct? Yes. Like, you had your own business? Yeah, sorry about that. And I was just... No, no, no. That's, I mean, we all start somewhere. Like I, I was much the same when I was younger. I was, I had a, a long capitalist phase yeah. of my life. And I was just wondering, like, do you, do you have like a, uh, I'm sure you've talked about this, but do you, did you have like a moment where you were like, oh, this capitalism stuff isn't all it's cracked up to be? Or like what happened to make you specifically say, I want to re-examine my life? So the funny thing is I moved to Vietnam to be a imperialist capitalist. I came to Vietnam originally uh, with a, with a, you know, potential business partner. And we were going to start a, our whole idea was to start a marketing agency here. That's kind of my, uh, Mm. my career has been in marketing for about 15 years. And the whole idea was to basically, I mean, I'm just going to be as blunt and candid and honest as possible. We basically wanted to start like a marketing sweatshop sort of deal where we were going to hire a bunch of low wage Vietnamese people and like get clients in the U S and Europe and, um, make a shitload of money for ourselves and then pay the employees very little. That was the ambition. When I first moved here, that was around 2013. 
And I didn't see it that way, of course, at the time. I saw it as like, you know, creating jobs and, you know, improving the economy of Vietnam or what, you know, I had all those like that imperialist mindset. Um, so, and that wasn't that long ago. Uh, and I, and I continued, well, fortunately, um, in a roundabout way, it's fortunate that my former business partner kind of, uh, went off the rails when it came to alcohol and Xanax and that sort of thing. And so that, uh, business idea ended up, we, we folded pretty quickly, um, because of those sorts of issues. So then after that, I bummed around and, and, and did a few different jobs here and there, um, for a few years. You stayed in Vietnam? Mostly, primarily. But I, I also did a stint in uh, Korea as a director of marketing for a American grocery store in Korea. And then I was uh, d- uh. the director of marketing for a company in Charlotte, North Carolina for about a year that was like this evil search and staffing company that just exploited the shit out of workers. Um, but I didn't really lose faith in capitalism until, I'm sure that your audience might already be guessing, uh, the 2016 election results when Donald Trump became president of the United States. I was kind of a, I, I got onto the Bernie, you know, I was a Bernie bro, uh, as it were. And, um, so Bernie Sanders first got me kind of questioning the American form of capitalism. There's, there's a lot more mm. to it. Um, you know, I, I kind of got into the more liberal, uh, social democracy kind of ideas when I moved to Korea initially, which was in 2012. So that got me turned on to like having actual healthcare, which I'd never had before. And they have really good public transportation. So that, that, so Korea kind of turned me into a liberal capitalist um but bernie sanders got me questioning capitalism and then after trump got elected that's when i was really like holy shit and i started my my whole worldview kind of shattered and i I lost all faith in the united states you know i was a i was a pretty patriotic american even while i was living Mm -hmm. in asia and even while i was seeing that you know they do a lot of things a lot better here i was still pretty patriotic and but once trump got elected i realized that the united states of america system was untenable unjust you know it, just the fact that we could elect a president like donald trump uh you know and and have all of these you know these really fascistic uh elements coming into the white house which again i was naive at the time i didn't realize that it had been pretty fascistic all along mm. um, but that's what got me kind of doing a lot of soul searching and i started hanging out in all these uh it was memes really memes are really what radicalized me to the left i was exposed to a lot of mm-hmm. memes and they got me into these leftist like Facebook groups. And that's kind of when I, that, from there I discovered uh, Kropotkin and anarchism and, uh, you know, Marx and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of like snowballed from there. So since 2016, which is really not that long ago, about four years ago, um, from that time I've been able to uh, become like a full-blown commie. And uh, now that's basically my job is making communist propaganda. So it's been quite a quick journey. It's really fascinating for me that you're saying that memes had a direct effect in introducing you to this heavy theory. And it kind of goes into my theory that I think a lot of political memes today are like the agit prop stuff of the Soviet Union Mm -hmm. of today. That it's Mm -hmm. like it's this uh, agitative propaganda that uh, gets people like enlightened in some way or introduced to these old theories and this this heavy material. Do you what role do you think like memes play in political discourse today? So I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this at the time that I was going through all these processes and, and that these memes were having this kind of effect on me. But I think that you use the exact right word is agitation. And um, I can't remember where I saw this, but I think it might have been in the ABCs of communism, which is a really great like yeah. turn of the last century yeah. book. Um, but they talk about agitation in that. And I think that's where I read this. But um, there's a definition of agitation, which I subscribe to, which is that agitation is taking one contradiction of capitalism and like highlighting it and pointing it out as starkly as possible and so yes yeah um i think that's what a meme a really good leftist meme does is it takes a a a particular contradiction of capitalism and it shows how absurd capitalism is in like a bite-sized chunk where it's like okay here is one striking contradiction of capitalism and it was really being exposed to all of that agitation over and over again and just really having those absurdities pointed out to me again and again and again on my facebook timeline that's mm. kind of what made me really realize just how shitty the system of capitalism is. So I think that's, yeah, I think agitation is a, is a perfect way to put it in terms of how memes it, it's interesting. You know, bolster the left. I was actually on the other side of, uh, of the whole meme thing at this, at, during the same time, 2015, 2016, and, and into early 2017. Mm-hmm. I was the one creating a lot of those leftist memes. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm sure that I saw a couple of years. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, it's possible that you actually saw 
something that I created or that I helped create. I was very involved in a... You might have radicalized me. You might, you might be the reason that yeah. non-compete exists today. It's very possible. <laughs> I have a friend, um, I have a few friends that have, you know, like one of my best friends uh, who I've known since I was in college, um, he's always been kind of a crypto commie. I didn't really know he was like so leftist, um, but he, you know, was was pretty big on uh, posting a lot of leftist memes, and that sort of thing. He, he's been trying to get me for a long time. You know, he pushed me over to being a liberal mm -hmm. initially, and um, he's just been kind of like very patiently dealing with my capitalist uh, shitty ass for a long time. Um, and then there's another friend uh, who who goes by the bread pill now um, and works a lot with trash can 1312. They, 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 there's this whole like collective of Twitch streamers. They call themselves the dumpster <laughs> gang, I believe. Um, but they were, you know, like a few. It was it, it was it's just funny how a, a small number of people that I that I knew fairly well, but I respected them. I knew they were very intelligent and um, it didn't take you know, it wasn't like I, I didn't read a book. I didn't watch any kind of like long documentary or anything like that. It was really just like a trickle of memes that pushed me into these left book groups and then hanging out and just watching these discussions. It was like a, a series of very small steps. It was never one big leap, yeah. you know, that right. they brought me to the left. Um, I didn't ever, I never had like a real epiphany. It just happened very gradually. I mean, the, the epiphany was, was Trump being elected. That was, that was the like, uh, you know, every, the, the rug being pulled out from under me. And that caused me to I fall. I think a lot of, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people today credit 2016 and that election as being what really like set them off the edge of like uh questioning everything they knew politically yeah. and yeah. um yeah i was just i was just wondering like do you think because i'm not i wouldn't consider myself an accelerationist or anything someone who says that you need like the whole system needs to be catastrophically bad in order for people to become class consciousness or gain class consciousness but do you think there's something to that that sometimes people have to be kind of woken up to to seek out and question what they think they know? Or is it more that this was bound to happen anyway because of the current state of capitalism? What do you think is really, this is a big question, I know, but do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I've thought about this a lot too. Because, you, you, you know, from a certain angle, you could say, like, maybe this is a case for accelerationism is the fact that Donald Trump's election has, in a lot of ways, energized a movement to the left. But that, I think, and there might be some truth to that for people who currently have a lot of privilege, right? So, like, one of the reasons I never really listen you can go all the way back to when i was in college i wasn't listening to women and things about feminism because i was a man and i just thought that you know i had the whole mindset that oh well, women already have the vote you know they can they're, they're, it's against a lot of discrimination against women in the office so therefore the project of feminism is finished it's like the end of yeah, history problem solved right <laughs> that's the way i felt you know because i wasn't a woman i wasn't experiencing these things firsthand and whenever women talked about their problems to me, I just wasn't listening. You know, I just thought you yeah. know, they were just whining is the way I thought about it and would have put it at the time. Um, you thought they had the tools to fix their own problem if they really wanted to. But then you find out that's not the case. They could have pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. Exactly. Um, but the thing about it is, is the people that are actually suffering the most under capitalism, the really, truly marginalized people, um, I think that they've, and, and I'm learning this, you know, not just from uh, analyzing it, you know, from the top down, but from talking to people who are in these marginalized communities, they've, they've known forever, you know, like uh, black people in America have known forever that the system is completely fucked, you know, um, cause they're the ones that are suffering the most. And the thing about accelerationism is it, it, you, you, the only, the only way I can see somebody to really argue for accelerationism is from a position of privilege, because mm. if you're an accelerationist, you're basically saying like, it's okay for a lot of people to, that are suffering already to suffer way more you know, mm. so that we can get the political goals that we want met. So I, I would say like, um, accelerationism is, is it's, it, it may even be an effective strategy in terms of like pushing people towards revolution, but it's a very callous, um, and sort of like selfish, uh, methodology. You know, I think there are other better ways to do it that don't put so many people at risk and harm so many people. If that makes sense. Hmm. That totally makes sense. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. I, I think, I think just in to add to what you, you were saying, I think a lot of accelerationism is aimed at getting the middle class specifically involved. People like uh, like people that go to Vietnam to start businesses or people that <laughs> may run businesses. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. people that aren't seeing the direct negative consequences of capitalism directly on themselves. I think the the whole theory is aimed at getting those people to go. Wow, I didn't know I was living in this system that's really really bad, and I'm only experiencing now from seeing you know, the fallout of this terrible presidential campaign 
and people actually voting for this guy, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and, and the same arguments are often made for, um, you know, de-radicalizing like the alt-right and Nazis and that sort of thing. And I, I guess I, I'm, I can't really say this concretely, but recently the more I've been engaged in these, kind, you know, we have all this discourse about not alienating, you know, young, white, edgy teens and that sort of thing and not alienating the middle class. But the more I... I guess I'm evolving towards a position where I'm starting to think like, you know, fuck the middle class, um, <laughs> you know, because like, first of all, the middle class is, is it has been shrinking for a long time. It's pretty small now. And on, globally speaking, there is I mean, if you look at it globally, there is no middle class. Mm. You know, the mm. middle class exists in imperialist, you know, incredibly developed countries. And it's always people that are in like these positions of extreme privilege and the people that are going to push a real revolution into place um, are, are not going to be the middle class. I mean, yeah. I, that's not to say I, I intentionally want to alienate them. Uh, and it's not to say that they're, you know, it, it, it is important to have people come around to our side from the middle class. But the, the things that I think would lead to a real change in the systems of oppression that, that you know, we all suffer from, it's going to be a ground up thing. And it's going to be the people that are, that are suffering the most. There are billions of people in the world who are suffering tremendously and I think they're the mm. people we need to be focusing on. And if we, if, if, I think we're overemphasizing the middle class and edgelord teens and Nazis and alt right people. I think that if we, it, it, when we do that, it, it, we are in a lot of ways perhaps uh, underemphasizing people that are more marginalized, and we're building distrust in a lot of ways because a lot of the strategies people are advocating for, um, you know, radicalizing over people who are currently reactionaries, it's like, you know not making such a big deal out of things like racial slurs, you know, and if we have leftist spaces where we're being tolerant and accepting of bigoted behavior and bigot, bigoted speech, we're, and I've had people of color and, and trans people and that's what, you know, like lots of marginalized people telling me they don't feel comfortable in a lot of leftist spaces yeah. and it's getting mm -hmm. worse. I think because a lot of these, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit in what we were going to talk about, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really think it's, it's dangerous to, like just open the floodgates and pre uh, it's kind of a contradiction in a way because we do need to build our numbers. Absolutely. I think the biggest task of the left right now is to build our numbers. But if we do that without any kind of concrete foundation set in terms of how we build those numbers and how we do the recruiting, we really are, are going to be turning off a lot of really desperately oppressed people. We're going to be sowing distrust and we're not going to be able to unify the left and build a, a solidarity, you know, build solidarity within our working class movement. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I guess I just kind of jumped five steps ahead. I think, um, yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And you also made a video uh, about that after your debate with Destiny, I believe, right? Where you talked yeah. about this exact thing of you need to be kind of, it's okay to be selective in who you want to join your cause, essentially. Like, it's okay to exclude people that, you know, are hateful and don't accept people for who they are if it means making a more meaningful and powerful movement that advocates for real social change. And I thought that was a really good point that you, that you made in that, in that video. And uh, I guess just like it, it, it varies so much regard, regarding what you said about the middle class too, how big it is, how powerful it is, because I think I can't speak for Sweden, but I, my impression is that in a lot of European countries, the middle class is the power mm -hmm. organ in the country because uh, obviously because it has the means and it has the affluence to have a, a direct impact on the labor market, on politics, et cetera, et cetera. But also because it's it's the it's it's their opinion that kind of impacts the rest of society. If the middle class decides that immigrants are bad, then that trickles down to the whole of the rest of society. I would say that's the case at least in Denmark and uh, Germany too. Mm -hmm. I would say, but yeah, I mean. I think that's why people do emphasize the middle class so much in, in the discourse and they're saying we need to get them on our side. But I think you're right, especially in a lot of uh, Anglican countries, the middle class is shrinking dramatically and that's causing a lot of unrest in the rest of society because that traditional power structure is kind of going away. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what I mean? Or do you, uh, like... Oh, I, I not only know what you mean, but I completely agree. And in fact, I think this is where it's important to kind of distinguish. I mean, because we have to remember there's a lot of battles being fought at the same time, right? So in the context of... Um, liberal democracy in the, in the systems of liberal democracy, uh, the middle class is vital, of course. And that's why, you know, the, the Republican Party and the Democrat, I, I don't, I know very, very little about European politics, but in the United States, you know, we have the Republican Party and we have the Democratic Party. They're the two mainstream kind of like liberal from a Marxist perspective, they're liberal 
uh, parties. And um, of course, they're always going to be focused on the middle class because they're the ones that vote the most. They're the ones that make campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're very important for a liberal capitalist system and elections and that sort of thing. So with, if you're talking about the project of reform and the project of, um, I call it like basically social triage, uh, you know, putting band-aids on, on situations um, yeah. to like alleviate suffering. In that context, the middle class is vital. Um, but I think that the liberals, uh, you know, the, the hardcore centrist liberals, the Democratic Party and that sort of thing, um, you know, they, they're not really concerned with system, systematic change. I think we all know that as socialists, as leftists. Um, so then we have to talk about the other project, which, you know, I'm a revolutionary leftist. I, I, I believe that the only way to solve these problems is by dismantling the systems that exist and building new systems in their place, right? Um, and I know that that's like a very far-fetched thing right now because we don't have enough momentum and we don't have the numbers to do that. That's where all this stuff gets so, uh, that's why, that's where we get like kind of quagmired in a lot of like disagreements amongst the left. Um, hmm. cause a lot of people are saying like, well, we got to have a big, you know, we got to build our numbers and which is true. We do have to build our numbers before we can have a revolution. And, um, it, it, but, uh, in terms of the project of building a revolution, I don't think the middle class is going to be that important. I think it's going to be. A matter of mobilizing the people who are the most desperately oppressed by this by the systems um and, and and in order to mobilize those people we have to be doing things like building our own dual power structures outside of those systems you know the elections matter because they alleviate suffering and that's not something we should ignore i would never discourage anybody from voting or from participating in the mainstream political process but as leftists that can't be the only project that we participate in we also have to have support and and a lot of momentum and energy and effort and resources put into the project of building a revolution and that means building direct uh, dual power structures and taking direct action and to me that means mobilizing the people who have the least i mean so for instance in the united states of america uh you know the people who are being m probably most publicly and visibly oppressed right now are the immigrants who are being you know caged like animals in concentration camps and if you're an undocumented immigrant in the United States, you can't vote, right? So, like, you're automatically ignored and cut out of the whole liberal uh, capitalist uh, democratic systems that are in place. So, but if we could mobilize those people, if we could organize those people, if we could help get some energy in that population and, and support them and do what we need to do to build a dual power structure where, where they have their own organs of, of, you know what, what I would say revolution um that's the kind of thing where I think that's going to be, be leading more directly to an actual revolution um so so in that context the middle class doesn't matter you know what I'm saying does that make yeah. sense that that makes a lot of sense I agree entirely yeah so it's not to say I, and I want to just really quickly I don't want to underemphasize like I don't think that um elections are useless no, and I don't no, think that the not. legislative and electoral bodies are useless it's just that that's a separate project mm. You know, yeah, no, than no. the revolutionary I, project. I, I agree, um, definitely. Like, we can't focus our our like all of our energy solely on elections. Nothing productive will really happen that way. But I, I just wanted to. I think at least in Sweden, I probably in in most of Europe, the lines, I think, between working middle and and upper class have been blurred a lot since the mm -hmm. uh, since the nineties, and. Um, it, it it feels to me that that I mean, most people call themselves middle class, even if they don't necessarily fit the definition. Uh, people might mm -hmm. see themselves as a lower middle class when instead they might be yes. working class. And in, I think that a lot of people, when they at least here, when they think working class, they think immigrant. They don't really. Mm -hmm. There's not really such a thing as a quote unquote Swedish working class anymore there's the immigrants who are the the lowest and then the the middle class which spans like 80 percent of the population uh, and you know you can be in the lower middle or upper end of the middle class and then you can be like the upper upper class which is like the the crazy rich people um mm -hmm. one of the problems i have with the swedish left party which is our socialist party is that their demographics mm -hmm. are essentially the same as the demographics of the center party which is like the centrist, liberal, almost libertarian-esque political party. They have a, roughly the same number of voters, and a lot of them are from the same demographic, which is highly educated, pretty well-off uh, women, mostly. 
um, you know, un like university educated women who, who are fairly well off, uh, much mm -hmm. more so than actual working class people who now more and more are going toward the reactionary side of the aisle, the the Sweden Democrats who are the, the nationalists, um, and, and sort of the social Democrats who are the traditional working class party, but, but they've also been also trying to be tap into the a uh, highly educated female market or demographic. Got to give it to women. They vote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they vote. They turn up. They they go. They you know they do activism, and and all that kind of thing. Um, but they only make up like sixteen percent of the population. That specific demographic, like the very highly educated, mm. uh, like middle not middle aged like young young as women. No, that's very much the same in Denmark. Yeah, it's it's uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of parties go for the same demographic of of highly educated uh, women specifically, mm -hmm. and the elderly. Funny enough, like uh, the elderly play a, a very yeah. important role. I think that's the same in America, right? And yeah. the Brexit yeah, sure. stuff too. It's mostly like elderly people. Uh, more depend. You can be more depend. Uh, you can uh, you can count on them voting more than young people. Mm. Oh yeah, young people basically don't vote in the U.S. at all. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's that's kind of leading into to what I'm interested to hear you uh, talk about too, American, is um, I have a lot of, like, I'm involved with leftist politics in Denmark where I live, and I was just curious because a lot of the people that I meet that are, that would agree with you politically 95% of the time, uh, luckily we do have a lot of, of, of those, um, but they refuse to vote in the elections for the reasons that we talked about. Like, how would you, do you have like a go-to uh, argument to, to convince people who like, um, are revolutionary to participate in parliamentary elections, even though it doesn't necessarily further the revolution. Yeah, I mean, for me, the best argument is just that it is a very, uh, it's like a, it's like a low effort thing you can do. It might not have a, a, you know, you as an individual might not have a massive impact on the system, and even like a block of voters together won't be able to have revolutionary systematic change. Mm. But it's like an easy thing to do. It takes. Yeah. A couple of hours at the most. I mean, I vote. I don't know if you can do this stuff in Europe, but like I've been voting absentee for a long time, uh, even before I moved yeah. to Asia. Even when I was living in the USA, I did. I, I just you can sign up and you can vote in the mail in the US. Mm -hmm. And you like, oh, wow. it's just it's just, it's a low effort thing. And yet collectively, it can help a lot of people who are suffering a lot. Uh, That's you know, it, it, it's just like, yeah, like like if we elect Bernie Sanders as president, I'm under no illusion that he's going to like bring about the new you know anarcho communist commune of the of of what used to be known as America or whatever um i think uh bernie is is a, a a liberal who is better than most you know he's he's he talks a lot about how capitalism is awesome and he uses a lot of he quotes um fdr a lot franklin delano yeah. roosevelt mm -hmm. who was basically single-handedly responsible for dismantling the socialist project in america during the great depression he talks a lot about how capitalism is, you know, very good because it s inspires entrepreneurship and innovation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and so, and, it, you know, I, I like Bernie Sanders as a candidate. I'm going to be voting for Bernie Sanders and I encourage other people to vote for Bernie Sanders. It's an easy thing to do. If Bernie Sanders does get elected president, a lot of people will suffer a lot less, especially if the other alternative is Donald Trump or mm. Joe Biden. Right. Um, so it's like. It doesn't take that much time. It doesn't take that much effort. It's a small thing you can do that does have real world impact. And it's like, what else were you going to do with your two hours that day? You know, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a low barrier, you know, and it, it, it's not going to change the world, but just do it. Just, just fucking do it. It's not a big deal. That's like, it's my best argument for voting mm. and participating. I now, the other thing is that uh, in... local, ele oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just think like, especially in European elections, it's, so it it's incredibly easy to vote and it takes 15 minutes to do it yeah like there are so many polling locations where you can go and you can vote like at least in, in sweden you can vote like two weeks in advance if you yeah. don't have the time on election day you can just go to the election to like the polling location any day of the week and they're open like the entire day. So you can go on, on on the weekend you can go after work like you have so much time to vote mm. there is no there's never an excuse to not vote. You, like, I don't have time where I have work. It's not an excuse because you can do it whenever. Mm, yeah. You have you have two weeks to do it. And then you can also do it by mail uh, or, or like in, in absentee. Like there are a million ways that you can do it, that you can get it done. Yeah. And, and like even election days are held on Sundays. Oh, wow. 
that would never fly in the U.S. Oh my gosh, the the religious right would be like up in arms about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's that's really cool though. Yeah. I mean, that, that like if, if it, but even in the U.S., I mean, it, at the worst, I think the longest it ever took me to vote was like maybe an hour and a half. I mean, and yeah. it's like you're minimizing harm is what you're doing. It's it, it, that's the way I look at it with like mainstream politics. We can minimize harm. I mean, if 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 we could prevent Donald Trump from getting elected as, as president again, that will be very a very important victory for a lot of people who are just i mean there 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 are people in concentration camps in the u.s like there's there's just yeah. no excuse not to try to do something to mitigate that harm um mm. and, and i was gonna say that in, in local elections in the u.s i'm not sure how it works in europe but like you actually can have a, as an individual even you can have a lot of impact in local uh politics i was oh, very yeah. heavily active when i was a liberal in local politics in the u.s in my hometown and um you know, we, we could, we, we saved the bus system, you know, like I, it was like me and a handful of other people and a lot of college students, you know, it's maybe all told it was maybe 30 or 40 of us together, young people mm. who don't have any power individually, but we went to the city council meetings. We raised a big fuss, a lot less people vote in local elections in the U S so you yeah. can actually have a lot of impact on the local level as well. And I, I think that what we need to be doing in 2020 plus moving forward is starting to field socialist candidates in local elections more and, and getting and getting yeah. people in the door in city councils and town councils and village councils and and starting to build like it, it, again, this all goes to the whole uh, idea of building dual power structures. If we could have like a little socialist, you know, little socialist enclaves here and there in small towns and big cities ar- around the world, um, you, you can get a lot done that way. The, like the local politics often impact people and, and talk about the middle class. You know, the middle class gets heavily impacted by the local government. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's where like mass line strategy is another thing I really advocate heavily for, which is just essentially mass line just means going into your community and talking to people, finding out what matters to them and then building your political praxis around what you're hearing from the community and inviting the community to participate in it. So it's like Mm -hmm. building a feedback loop between your activism and the community and just trying to tie the community into what you're doing as much as possible. Because if you could go in and you could do something like save the bus system or, you know, uh, prevent uh, prevent like those. The, the What do they call it? The the when they put like spikes on the benches and that kind of shit. Like if you can yeah, help people spikes. Yeah. that If you could stop that kind of shit from happening and help people in ways that like really affect them. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that builds momentum in, in the small victories. We need to be collecting small victories right now as a movement. That's what's going to give the movement energy, and that's what's going to really lead to a lot heavier recruitment numbers, I think. I agree entirely. Local politics is so important, and it's a very good way to get people involved with the, the movement in general. I think that's a very good point. Uh, kind of going we, back to Bernie. We've talked about this Sorry? In, the, in the past. Yes, we have. Yeah, we've discussed this, uh, and I absolutely agree that it's, it's vital if you're going to build any meaningful movement that you need to get the yeah. local... Uh, like, yeah. You can get, like, five of your friends and go join your local democratic party uh branch and essentially take it over yeah it's amazing fairly easily it's amazing because who like who the fuck actually joins the democratic party <laughs> like their local branch and like goes to their meetings and votes on stuff like no one does that yeah that's the more important thing is who shows up to the meetings not a lot of people oh, yeah. if you go yeah. to a city council meeting it's like the same five or six old people you know like it's it's it, it, cuz i i actually this is kind of a funny little sidetrack but when I was in high school, my friend, I had this really good friend and he, he's kind of like has this great sense of humor. And, um, he was like, Hey, what are you doing Tuesday night? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not doing anything. And he's like, let's go to the city council meeting. I was in this little t- small town, Goose Creek, South Carolina. And I was like, town mm. council meeting. Why the fuck would we do that? And he's like, you got to go. It's hilarious. And so we went there and it was just like <laughs> as a joke, but like there are these two old guys that like had this, fe- we started going every week and there, it was like watching a soap opera. Cause there were these two old guys that like. One was kind of more conservative and one was more liberal and they were like constantly fighting about like because they were neighbors too. That was what was great. Um, but like <laughs> I saw so I originally was going there literally just for the lulls. But um, but I saw yeah. that like a very small number of people could have real impact and you just have to go there and be vocal. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. it, you would be amazed what you can accomplish just by going and showing up at your city council meetings and just being vocal, stepping. Anybody could step up. I don't know how it works again in Europe. It might be different. But in the U.S., most towns, anybody can go up and say whatever they want into that microphone for like two minutes or whatever time limit they have. And that mm-hmm. is a huge opportunity. It's a platform and it's something anyone can do. 
Yeah, those local town meetings are amazing. Sometimes I'll go on YouTube and just look them up, just like small town <laughs> city council meetings, because they're just incredible what goes on in those it and the really way that is. they speak to each other. It's it's amazing. If nothing else, it's, it's free entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's incredible because you see these incredibly like professional looking city council people having to explain why like M and M's aren't being poisoned by the Russians to the local people. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh ma'am, I understand your concern, but uh <laughs> It's amazing, <laughs> but you can you can be productive as well, and and go. It's like you. It's like you laugh a little. You you make some friends along the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they do seem to be friends. All those people that do show up to, to city council. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, I think it's a great praxis. Local politics. Yeah. Yeah. A thing I wanted to to ask you about with Bernie specifically is, uh, I guess there's a short story attached to this. There was a very famous uh, union labor leader who was a Marxist in Denmark uh, who pushed for what he called economic democracy, where um, basically Mm -hmm. it's like a Marxism light where all the laborers would own uh, the business that they work for. And he was very like, he was almost like Jimmy Hoffa in a way, without the mob stuff. Like he was very effective at organizing (laughs) people and striking and protesting. And they achieved a lot in terms of real pay in terms of benefits, privileges, et cetera, et cetera. But when he retired, he gave a very famous speech where he said that we've succeeded our way straight into hell, essentially, because as terms and privileges got better and as people like as as people experienced that they the lifestyle that they had at the time that he retired was so good that they didn't really need to protest or strike for anything more or anything more democratic in the work in the workforce, he felt that the engagement of the working class had declined as a result because they didn't they didn't feel the need to actively do anything to improve the situation. Do you think that there's a chance you mentioned how FDR was like instrumental in dismantling socialism in America? Do you think that the concerns of socialists and revolutionary communists and revolutionary socialists uh, of of Bernie having the same effect on this newly found radicalized left uh, that uh, that they're afraid of? Or do you think it's different with Bernie? I yeah I don't so like I there's a risk that like capitalism and the and the power structures of capitalism could recuperate our socialist movement for sure mm. you know and I think that's where vigilance needs to be you know a high priority for leftist activists and we need to make sure that the capitalists don't take all of the things that we're trying to do and 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 roll it up into their own system so a great example of that um, is <laughs> this is so bad. The, there's, I'm sure that uh, most of your listeners have heard of the Earth Strike movement and the what do they call it Fridays for yeah. uh, Global Climate Change or whatever. Fridays for Future. Yeah, right, right, right. Is um, that the thing that um, Greta Thunberg is yeah. involved? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, they're all kind of connected, from what I understand. They 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 kind of work together and, mm. and help each other with uh, co marketing and that kind of stuff. But essentially, there's this movement. That, I think there was an, a day of Earth Strike um, in September. And, uh, and, and so this is what, this is, this is just an amazing example of recuperation. So recuperation is whenever a capitalist entity or capitalist power structures kind of take over a movement for social change so that it becomes kind of capitalist friendly. So what Facebook did is they actually had official Facebook stickers that you could put on your photos on your Facebook feed that said like, join me for the climate strike on September or whatever, you know? And um, and I think a, a lot of corporations like gave their employees the day off for the for the strike day or whatever. And that is just like mm-hmm. amazing to me that they're recuperating strikes now. You know, like they're 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 making like capitalist woke uh, oh, yeah. strike days, you know, around around the world now. And that's a huge danger because if capitalists turn into this kind of like fun thing you do so that you can put a sticker on your Facebook photo and get a little social credit and and get some likes on your on your picture or whatever. I mean you know, and your, and your company gets involved. It's like, yeah, you can have the day off for this strike. Like that kind of thing yeah. is terrifying <laughs> to me because I can mm. totally see that going the wrong way. And unfortunately I could see that happening with Bernie. Um, you know, like we're, we're capitalists cause, cause capitalism is amazingly, if nothing else, um, it's, it's very flexible in being able to like take things that threaten it and just completely co-opt it and, and declaw it. You know, so mm. that's something that worries me about the Bernie Sanders thing is that like if he goes in and he he creates some kind of like socialist light system in America and doesn't really shake up the actual power structures um, and leftist activists just kind of like sit on our laurels after Sanders gets elected, you know, mm. then that could create a situation where um, 
you know, a lot of people don't uh, want to move any further after we've, you know, gotten our universal health care and, you know, you know, basically turned into like another like South Canada or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, that that is a fear. OK, but it's not I don't think it's that difficult to mitigate that fear as long as we are continuing now and in the future to build our own power structures outside of that capitalist system. And I think if we could create like uh, workers councils and uh, relief organizations, you know, stuff like like uh, homeless shelters and, and and whatever, whatever, you know, there's a million different ways that you could build dual power structures in your in your community. But these have to be things that are like community led, democratic, flatly hierarchical and give people an actual voice and give people an actual power over their own lives. And I have this, it, it, you know, Kropotkin talked about this over 100 years ago, and I, and I, I still think it's, it's true. Once people really know what it's like to have actual control over their own destiny, they will not be willing to give that up. Mm. Uh, you know, it, mm. it's, it's like, um, we saw it a little bit in Catalonia during the Spanish uh, Civil War. You know, the fascists had to eradicate the people in Catalonia that were, uh, you know, they had to, they had, they, there's a reason that they shipped them over to the concentration camps in Germany. A lot of these Spanish anarchists was because once they got a taste for what life can be like without hierarchies, with democracy, with equality, um, it's like you don't want to give that up. And once people taste freedoms, once people know what it's like to have a voice, they don't want to give that up. So if all we do is we build some kind of single payer healthcare system and it's kind of OK and it's, you know, it rolls along, but it's not really democratic and it's not really what we as anarchists really want to see in the world then yeah we'll, we'll probably get lazy and it'll just be another you know socially democratic kind of liberal uh welfare system where mm. people don't really have mm. a voice and that is a danger you know but at the same time if yeah even in a system like that it's better and easier to organize and build our dual power structures than it would be in the capital hellscape we have right now in the usa where a lot of people can't organize just because they have to work three jobs because they have to be able to afford health care and feed their kids and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, I think we have a better platform for launching revolution under uh, some kind of social democracy, liberal state kind of thing than we do under Donald Trump's America, if that makes sense. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, just to go off of like, um, I think like one of the people that was really good at pointing the, uh, all of this co-opting by capitalism out was Mark Fisher. Uh, mm -hmm. rest in peace uh, who mm -hmm. wrote a lot about about and and the same with adorno this incredible versatility of capitalism to co-opt courses uh, causes and uh and and strikes and protests in such a way to minimize its influence or to make it seem more trivial or like a part of a bigger spectacle uh under capitalism under the wing of of capitalism you saw i think uh, a very important thing to also point out is that the same thing happened to the pride uh, um, protests, uh, it's become increasingly um, infiltrated by and affected by capitalist uh, uh, corporations and, oh, yeah. and uh, interests. Like, I went to Copenhagen Pride the first time 10 years ago, and I went to it last year, and it was really stark in how it's changed. Like, now you'll see, like, floats by McDonald's going through the whole thing saying, uh, everyone's uh, appreciated, uh, come to McDonald's and eat our cheeseburgers for only you know, one dollar today, like it becomes like it, it becomes mm -hmm. this watered down, like um, grossly uh, capitalist influenced and infiltrated thing, which is just it, it, it loses every impact it has. It loses its teeth when that happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the main faults, as you pointed out, or dangers of someone like Bernie Sanders. But I still would say that, like, I agree with you that it's still it's a, it's a matter of harm prevention to get someone like Bernie in place. Um, simply f because of how uh, detrimental Trump is to American society and the world, like the, everything that's going on in the world at the moment, like no one seems to be getting off yeah. easy mm. from him. Yeah, even um, conservative political parties in in Sweden have been getting in on the pride parades lately. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's only been these last couple of years, but but like the uh, the the main conservative party, the moderate party, who like not a long time ago were like voting against trans rights, were voting against civil unions for, for same-sex couples, and were like voting against civil rights for same for uh, homosexual people and voting for eugenics and all that kind of shit. Now are like marching through pride as if like 
oh, we're so proud of the of the LGBT community and and we love them so much and we've done so much to help them. Like, no, you haven't. Like these pride parades largely were made to protest against you <laughs> and now yeah. you're marching in them <laughs> now you're a part of it and you haven't really changed yeah. there's a funny story or tragic really because okay so world pride is being held in copenhagen in 2020 and uh the whole like trans and, and homosexual community went out and said we don't want world pride because it's it's too big and it, it's going to be like the whole message is going to be lost on on everything that's going on but the conservatives in copenhagen pushed it through and financed it by legitimately taking away funds from shelters for trans people. Oh, so they're financing <laughs> World Pride by taking away direct funds from the trans community. Yeah. I mean, I laugh, but it's not funny. Mm. Like, well, I'm sure it, a lot of people terrible, made money. But it, but it's, like a lot of capitalists made... Yeah. It, it, it was a business venture, is what is probably the way that... I, I'm just assuming that's a totally... It is, yeah. yeah. ...an assumption, but I'm sure that they just wanted to get some... You know, it was like the Chamber of Commerce thought that would be a good way to get a lot of local business, you know, like that's probably what happened. Yeah, and a yeah. lot of tourists, like a lot of yeah. money for the local <laughs> businesses. That's disgusting. I mean, yeah. but, but at the same time, it's like, um, it's why I think I'm a revolutionary anarchist and I do believe that we should be building a revolution, but that doesn't mean we can't be working on reform at the same time. I, 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 I have had a lot of like kind of heated uh, discussions with my comrades who are reformists because there are reformist communists mm. you know uh they're wrong yeah. but they exist i'm just i'm just i'm kind of just kidding um but you know I i've always you, said like socialist <laughs> yeah like i hope that you're right is you know like I, I i i would i would love to be proven wrong that it's possible to achieve communism through reform right so i'm not like going to oppose um projects and 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 activities that might you know reformistically that there's got to be a better word for that, but you know, gradually uh, move us towards um, socialism and and acceptance and, and tolerance for people and that sort of thing. Um, and I would, and as much as I wanted to, to throw up whenever you talked about the rainbow Ronald McDonald, um, mm. I would rather have <laughs> the McDonald's floats in the gay pride parade than have gay people losing their civil rights. You know, or as mm -hmm. as we're as you know, or, or trans people losing their civil rights as they're now facing in the USA. Um, you oh, know, yeah. like if, if if I had a choice between uh, recuperated uh, social change or social regression, I'm going to choose the recuperated social change. It's just that I think we can do the the alleviation activity, the reformist activity, as we simultaneously plan and design and enact an actual revolution. I think we could walk and chew bubblegum at the same time in that regard. That's yeah, a very important point too. Yeah, like one is very abstract and big picture, and the other is very immediate, taking away someone's rights. Uh, and uh, obviously, you have to always go for like what's the least harmful to the the community that it affects. Yeah, but they can also mm -hmm. reinforce each other and be like I think, in my opinion, the revolution is happening right now. You know, there there are like so a great example would be um, there was a huge storm, like a hurricane in uh, Puerto Rico, and um, Anarchist organizations did way more disaster relief than like Trump's administration. And, mm. and, and mm. We, that yeah. right there is an exact, that's exactly what I'm talking about when I say dual power structures, direct action, um, and mass line. Cause that's a system where, you know, we're building our own organizations outside of the political system, outside of the corporate system. They're taking direct action. They're not asking for permission. Um, and, uh, and they're having real positive change. And as they do that, you know, they're getting building awareness for our movement. They're spreading the word about what anarchism actually means. I mean, there's another group in Seattle that like fills in potholes. Um, you know, they just go out, they get some tools, they go out and they fill in potholes in uh, in like the Pacific Northwest. And um, again, that's like did, you're solving did you a problem. See, um, when Domino's did that, the pizza chain, <laughs> they filled in a pothole and then they like uh, graffitied over it like. Uh, this pothole brought to you by Domino's. You, you see how the kidding. private market can fix anything? Oh, yeah, that is recuperation. Exactly. That is the textbook. Ex <laughs> because I know that there was an anarchist organization that did the same thing where they would, it was a similar thing where they would go and they would find uh, potholes and they would like spray paint penises around the potholes. And it was <laughs> yeah, like, it, it forced that. the city to like go and fix those potholes. So I'm sure that some Donald, uh, uh, some Domino's uh, slick, marketing guy like like a shithead like i used to be you know saw that news story and they were like we could do this with pizza we could sell a shitload of pizza <laughs> it's like the, the porn hub snowplow 
Do you know about that? Yes. The, <laughs> that's the kind of shit we got to be careful about because like that's recuperation. Um, and we have to call it out when we see it. Yeah, ex- except I was about to say that if, if the city removed the Domino's logo, Domino's would probably sue the city. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm a I'm a prison reformist, but I hope that those Domino's employees go to prison for that. <laughs> this episode of Shit Island was brought to you by our patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Asher Scapegoat. Thank you to our $1 patrons, Jedi Devian, Mellow Mel, Michael Rook, Emil Segerbeck, Kva Graham, Inge Leonora, Anakin for you, and Gigabyte. And thank you to our $5 patrons, Nyen Chan Min, M Lim, and As Koala as possible. And thank you to our $15 patron, Joshua Cheesman. If you would like to have your name read on this podcast and receive other benefits, then you can become a patron over on patreon.com forward slash Asher Scapegoat. Thank you for listening to part one of our talk with American Johnson. As I said, part two will be up next week. See you then.